Okay, welcome everyone to this interview from the SPE Digital Transformation um, section. We are very happy to have Ruby Roberts with us today, talking about organizational effectiveness and psychological factors in digital transformation in our industry, in oil and gas, in energy industry. Ruby, very much welcome you today. You are a professor at Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. You've done some extensive research in this area, both from human psychological factors, what it takes to manage change and to, to transform companies and to um, distill innovation and foster innovation. We're very keen to hear your insights today. Um, as you know, the industry is striving for digital transformation for more effectiveness in its operations, to be more um, sustainable in its operations and to be more attractive to talent. And so we would love to hear from you what these factors are. First of all, what are the human factors? What makes change or what might be a key blocker in innovation and change? Well, thank you, Matthias, for having me. Um, for clarification, I'm Dr. Ruby, not professor, though I would love to be professor. And so if you have the capability of doing that, I'd love it. But otherwise, thank you for having me uh, today's as part of today's podcast. So you're totally right. We've been running research looking at technology adoption uh, and how the psychological and organizational factors influence how we respond to technology. And that's it's not very surprising when we think about it. You know, we think about uh, how we uh, make decisions about cars we buy, TVs, phones. So when we come into this digitalization space, it's unsurprising that how we think and feel about these changes and these new technologies are going to influence how well we make that transition. Um, and we found a lot of different uh, factors uh, within our research and we did this in a few different ways. So we wanted to understand well, what are these psychological factors? It's a little bit like a, a black box. We, we know that people make decisions, but we're not quite sure how they're doing this, right? Um, and so what we found was that there was a wide range of factors and these uh, were from things to do with how innovative we are, you know, so are you an innovative person? Do you like trying out new things um, or perhaps are you more uh, risk averse? Do you prefer doing things as you always have done? Uh, and depending on where you sit in terms of your personality, um, that will influence how you respond to, to new technology and, and new ways of working. Uh, so along with personality factors, we found things that were relating to our attitudes and our attitudes are, are really come down to how we think, feel and behave about something. So do you have a positive attitude about digitalization? Do you think it's valuable? Um, and plenty of people during the study when we were talking about new technology maybe didn't hold the most positive attitudes toward new ways of working. Um, so th these types of factors can all influence how you feel about it, and then that will influence the decisions that you make uh, in that kind of space. Well, Ruby, that sounds extremely interesting. That it's actually that it's that it's so much dependent on how I feel about something. But if we now look at the fact that. I mean, digital is here, right? I mean, we're having this totally digital conversation now after having thought out the starting problem, thanks to you, Rui. Um, <laughs> so digitalization became a part of everybody's life, of everybody's private life. Th does for that sure. actually create positive energy for the working life and makes it easier to adopt change there? Okay, so we are wonderfully able to do this online and, and it's wonderful to be able to speak to you both. Um, and, you know, our, our digital lives are, are a big part of our personal lives and our home lives. But when we think about digitalization in the work context, I think it will make it easier to, to make that transformation because we're more familiar with it. And if you have an idea, you, you can try and relate it to something familiar from our personal lives. Um, but the context is important. So in my personal life, what risk is there to me adopting a, a new phone or TV or smart speaker system in my house? Well, relatively, you know, there's the, the, the cost 
Um, but what's the consequence? You know, my job, if it doesn't go well, my, my job isn't on the line. Nobody's going to punish me because I didn't install it properly. And so when we think about change and digitalization in our personal lives, yes, that will make it easier to begin with and have that conversation and say, okay, well, Patrick, I want you to wear a smartwatch while you're working on the rigs. And it's easier to sell that idea because you've used a smartwatch maybe when running or working out um, and you know what it does and, and how it works. But the risk is different because the context is different. Does that mm -hmm. does that help? You, you, you have to think about the context that you're making those changes mm -hmm. in. Definitely. I mean, it, it, it definitely links together. So I, I can understand that um, my perception of something or my attitude to with something is driven greatly by how much I risk, how much I'm exposed. Um, yeah. yeah, totally. But I mean, still quite frankly, I mean, I, I, the whole world changes continuously all the time everywhere. And if I don't participate yeah. in change, if I don't keep up, um, I'm gonna be left behind, right? It's like, if I don't learn how this stuff works in 20 years, I won't be able to communicate with my bank anymore. Okay. So I mean, uh, what does that driver play for a role? So we are, yeah, you're totally right. We are constantly surrounded by change. And the, you know, the last year has taught us anything is that we need to be adaptable and respond to change. Um, but in our normal, in our normal lives before the pandemic, most changes that we experienced were incremental changes. Um, and then when we did have a big change, those represented a huge part of our lives. You know, if we changed our jobs um, or a new member of our family uh, arrived or perhaps we moved house, these really big changes, they take up a huge part of our lives, you know, in our minds and the way that we think about them. And the other changes, they're relatively small and incremental. So yes, we are surrounded by change, but we're not necessarily as humans that good at responding to, to huge changes. And we saw that during the pandemic where people suddenly we're thrown into this whole new world and, and it wasn't just a new way of living at home, but it was a new way of working. And all these changes were extremely disruptive. So when we're talking about digitalization, we have to think about, is this change an incremental change? You know, it's moving from Teams to Zoom, that's an incremental change, or is it an entirely different way of working, whereas this would have once have been in a nice conference room and we'd have went for drinks afterwards, um, to now doing this in an entirely virtual way. So it's the type of change and the size of the change and then what consequences are attached to those, you know, so it's thinking about how that change, how do you feel about that change. We are surrounded by it all the time, but it's different types of change. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can pick up on that and look at the at our oil and gas industry. Remember, still from a personal perspective, we'll come to leadership and management later. But uh, on a personal perspective, I'm now seeing in the industry not necessarily this disruptive change. It's not like Airbnb, it's putting a risk on the hotel or what you were taking the risk of all the taxi drivers. I'm seeing an incremental change still happening with new technology here and there popping up. But by and large, it's quite adoptable. Now, how can I, as a person, uh, reflect better on my drivers and behaviors and not be driven by, let's say, unconscious fear factors and make more uh, profound and, and reasonable decisions and reflecting on my behavior? I'll give you an example. I've been attracted to the industry um, because it is technology driven. It was always digital, even 30 years ago, and it was innovative. It really attracted me. It was always willing to put up significant risk and put money into new innovation and technology to see whether it works. And, and so that, that attracted me. I can show that current you know, junior generations are attracted the same way to similar industries. But when I'm also in a different position, let's say I have family, I have, I have kids, I have uh, all of that, how can I be as rebellious? How can I be as risk-taking and say, fail fast, learn fast and move on? When I have skills that brought me here, but I'm maybe not feeling and maybe fearful of not being able to learn as fast and to adopt as fast. How can I overcome this into a positive attitude, into an embracing and grasping attitude? I think that's a question that we're all 
going through just now in in terms of our personal and work lives of how, how should I best cope with this and I think the big first step that you've probably already taken is to be aware or to have an awareness that the decisions that we make and the way that we feel are influenced by lots of different factors um, and that those factors might not necessarily always be that obvious um, and our sudden automatic response of oh this is very scary oh I don't like it no thank you um, can actually be driven by other things like concern about our our uh, job security and motivations so my first suggestion would be to have a an honest think about how you feel about things and you don't have to tell anybody you can just think about it internally how do you feel about them and what's influencing those decisions and, and be honest with yourself because sometimes we maybe don't make the decisions based on the best information at the time and if we can be honest about why we're making those decisions we can then do something useful about it so as an example if you were an innovation manager who was being offered, say, a new piece of software um, and you don't know the startup company um, and you don't necessarily know that much about it, but it's your job to decide, make an initial decision whether to let that company pitch to your colleagues, for example. Now, your initial response might be, thanks, no thanks. Uh, and lots of startup companies can attest to that that's your experience, um, I can assure you. But if you think about it a little bit more in depth and go, well, why did I have that response? Was it because genuinely that software is not appropriate? And sometimes it is, but sometimes it's actually more to do with a fear of change. And is that technology in some way a threat to me as a person? C could it replace me? Um, and lastly, do I have the knowledge and expertise to make that assessment because technology changes uh, while we sleep, uh, changes rapidly. And so to, to, to stay on the ball and to have the latest up-to-date knowledge requires a lot of attention and effort and can be quite tricky to do that. So it may be that actually your initial response was actually driven by risk perception, maybe not having the most up-to-date knowledge on, on how to make that assessment and a, and a fear of how that might impact on me. And I might still have made the same decision, but I might not have. Or I may have been able to say, OK, I'm going to go and find out about this technology. I'm going to update my expertise. Um, go ahead. Yeah, apologies if I jump yeah, in. I can see you. I can see, I, you. I, I, I see your face. I find this absolutely thrilling. So th does that mean if I'm sitting in a meeting or in a discussion and somebody comes up with a new idea I have no clue of, I rather tend to say no than to yes. say, I have no clue. Please tell me more. Yes. Yeah, so in, in my world, um, I would hope that you would have the opportunity to say, you know what, Ruby and Matthias, that's a great pitch. Thank you for sharing with that with me. But in all honesty, I really don't know that area well enough. Please educate me. Or perhaps there's a colleague who knows more about it that I can bring into this conversation. But I think that's predicated on having a good organizational culture where you're not blamed for not knowing things. You know, we're all very used to always having an answer ready. You know, we, we, we can't say we don't know because something bad might happen. That is also interesting from a industry perspective. On one side, we have always been technology savvy and interested. But on the other side, we would also um, be risk averse. Yeah? I mean, we're sure. doing well where we have to be safe and seen as safe and put everything in place to avoid, avoid risk. On the other hand, we're also in a, in a cost-driven culture where we are try, try, uh, competing for commodities. So we have to be also um, delivering on time and on the cost promise and to the quality and specs. So taking new technology in might be advantageous in, in the lab stage, but it is quite uh, difficult to implement in a uh, running project stage because the, the, the perceived downside is much larger than the perceived yeah. upside. And even if it was 50-50, I would probably find most managers deciding on going with the safe bet. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a story that it resonates across the industry and probably out with oil and gas within other areas of business mm -hmm. where you maybe are being offered something which will offer you an advantage, but it has to offer a hugely significant advantage 
that it so outweighs any potential risk that then you may be willing to do that. Um, and you see these these decisions in, in, in other industries like healthcare and aviation where safety and cost is very much a uh, part of that decision making process as well. Maybe you can bring in a personal example here, in which <clears throat> I, I saw before the calculation of value of information, which is the, usually the value of new technology. So you're trying a new technology out, you calculate the value of it versus not doing it with all the chance factors. And if that is significantly positive, then you would think that a reasonable person would uh, decide on going for it. I have seen over and over that management will tend to not, but not take the action because they're not emotionally attached to it. And to bring this point home, when, when we introduced 4D seismic, which was a new technology at the time, no risk, but for significant upside. Uh, but of course, significant investment also. Uh, the only thing that made the manager convince was the picture, or accidental picture over his own field, where this technology was proven to work. Before the VOI was not working, the value of information was not working. But when we could show that adjacent survey also covered part of his field with a positive response, he was going for it. Uh, what can we learn from that aspect versus reasoning versus emotional affinity? So in, in psychology, there is an idea of loss aversion where you will, as a human, tend to fixate on the potential of losing something. And that's partly why humans are so keen uh, and we tend to focus on the negative. And that's a, a kind of evolutionary Say you know feel safe that we we want to try and stay safe and we don't want to get eaten by the saber toothed tiger or run over by the bus. So when we make decisions, we do tend to overestimate the value of loss uh, or in this case risk. So what's the risk involved? Um, so in this context, what would you have done differently? Would you have? highlighted that it was uh, familiar? Would you have highlighted the value? What might you have done differently if you could have done that same, you know, second time around? I, I, I really don't know because the, the only thing I do know is that uh, having a real proof of concept not in the real field was making the difference. And I've, I've <laughs> seen this as well in other technologies. Those that go to field trial very fast are more convincing than those that do all the literature and lab work that is much less risky in terms of investment, but is much lower in pace of, of uh, realizing uh, of, of realizing innovation. So I, would, I would tend to to support you know rapid scale, proof of concept and rapid scale up. So I wonder if there is an implicit assumption there that if it something's happened very quickly, it must mean that it's good. Um, and that may be the case, but sometimes the case is that the technology, for example, is very good, but for whatever reason, the CEO, MD of this startup company, maybe they had two children or their parent, you know, and there was a delay in the project, or perhaps the person who was their champion in the sponsoring company or the company that was a degree to trials, for whatever reason in their, in their planning, it was delayed by six months. So we sometimes assume that just because it's happened quickly, that it's better. And that's not necessarily always the case. It, it's a good rule of thumb. Um, but I wonder if there's like an assumption that we, we think that if it's happening quickly, then it's good. And we sometimes forget that there are other factors other than it being a poorer quality thing that can delay it. Is that the psychological effect of my, my friends do it so I can? <laughs> we, we call it herd mentality. <laughs> well, let, let me jump on the herd mentality, um, maybe in a bit inverted way. I, what I understood is, yes, we are afraid of losing. And I think the better off we are, the more afraid we are. Yeah. Um, and I, that sounds very human and logic. But what surprises me over and over again is that oil and gas appears slow in the adoption of digitalization. And then you have these other industries that are so fast. And if you see when Amazon moves into a market, the market value, the company values drop by a few percent because the whole stock market assumes that Amazon is going to turn this upside down. Doesn't matter what it is, books, pharmacies, TVs, whatever. 
I mean, do we really believe oil and gas can't be disrupted? Uh, do we really believe that you that just because you can't Uberize oil and gas, parts cannot be totally disrupted? What is it what stops us from seeing the, the, the saber-toothed tiger that is maybe three bushes away? So I would be of a similar um, perspective that from my experience of, of working with people who work in oil and gas, uh, I live in the northeast of Scotland. Everybody here works in oil and gas. I can look out at my neighbours and they're an incredibly innovative bunch of people really smart, incredibly innovative, come at challenges in all kinds of ways. So I'm of the mentality that, that they can cope, that the industry can cope and adapt and change. But it depends on whether your key decision makers, the ones that who are deciding whether to make those changes, also hold that belief. Um, and to come on in the saber tooth tiger point, it depends on how long the way you think that change is going to happen. So if you think that saber tooth tiger is going to come and knock on the door at, you know, four o'clock in 25 minutes, then I'm going to feel pretty nervous. But if you tell me that it's going to happen in 20 years time or 30 years time, the risk to me is a lot lower uh, and how I will respond to that's lower. And I wonder if that's part of how the industry responds. It, it maybe doesn't feel that the change is happening now. It's something that will happen in the longer term and how we think about risk in the longer term is different than how we think about it in that short term right now kind of thing. So it's a bit like um, as much as I'm worried about not losing, I'm, I'm hoping that it will go away and yeah. don't catch me. Yeah, a little good, bit. I mean, it's, very, it's much more complicated than that. And I'm sure that there's experts who will watch this and be horrified that I just said that. But that is an, an aspect of, of, you know, that short term versus long term and how we make decisions in that way. And, and I think though. it's very refreshing to also understand that this applies to very senior managers and executives like to anybody else. Timing was a good point. Um, we spent lovely 20 minutes with you. It was fantastic to understand all these aspects. A last question we always ask, what can a young engineer now do to prepare him or herself for the digital future? So I am not a, a, a digital expert, so I wouldn't suggest where best to seek training and where best to seek um, your, your next advanced level of training. I would think about how innovative you are as a person. Uh, and you can do this quite simply by thinking, how do you feel about change? Does it, does it excite you? Does the thought of working in a new way excite you? And you go, ooh. Or does it give you that cold feeling where you're not comfortable with it? Uh, and I think for the coming industry, it will be individuals who are open to it, who will tend to succeed more. And, and so I would think about young engineer, you've just graduated, if you're open to the idea of working in different ways and changing, you're probably going to do really well. If you're less comfortable with it, it would be thinking about how could you make yourself comfortable with it and how can you then develop your career in that way? Because mm -hmm. um, you can learn skills, but you can't necessarily learn how to be, to be really open to it. That's a practice thing. And if I may just build on that, uh, so thank you for the young engineer. If I now think about a manager who has not only young engineers who are striving for innovation, but the whole cadre with all their experience and all age groups and with a complete diversity, creating an environment in which, um, if you like, the, the, um, the industry knowledge and skills are valued in alongside with innovation to do the change. So what can an, a, a manager do in terms of creating the right environment in which the organizational organization is changing and people are thriving within it all, all, all across the board of you know, staff that you have. So what would you what would you advise a manager to support an organization of, of change and digital transformation? So firstly, uh, I would probably say something cheesy. Many managers from, from those that I've spoken to often feel quite threatened by the big change uh, and some don't feel that there is a space for them in this new future oil and gas world and to those I would say you are definitely valued 
and the expertise and knowledge and skills and people and network and all these things that you've spent decades building up is incredibly important and that you should feel valued. And this isn't something that you know you should feel threatened by. It can be very easy to be feel threatened by it, I am sure, um, but they are the key to providing a pathway for those younger engineers to get there. And in terms of how could those managers develop an environment to make it easier, it's kind of the basic things. So developing relationships so that you can trust each other. And so that if you trust each other, then when you're trying out new ways of working and new technologies, you feel safer doing it. Uh, another really big one is, is what do you do if you do something wrong? So if you know, how do you respond to things going badly? And, and, and even just saying, oh, I don't know, or I have misspoke, or I have made an error, or, or these types of things that recognize that you as a manager can also make, you know, the wrong decisions and, and be open about it, makes it easier for others within your team to not feel like they're going to get blamed. And if you can develop an, a, a team which respect each other, trust each other, and they don't feel that something terrible is going to happen if something goes wrong, it engenders much quicker, um, not failing fast, but trialing of new ideas and moving through these because other industries can move much faster than we can in oil and gas. So it's engendering that team where we can move through these ideas quicker. Um, so it's really just being a good manager and a, and a decent human being, um, to be honest with you. That if it was just that easy. Well. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> if it was just that easy. Ruby, thank you very much. It was a lovely interview. I learned a lot. I love the idea of looking into how you feel in the moment you make decisions and learn more about the hidden things that might influence your decision. Matthias, thank you very much for having arranged for the meeting. Um, I can also say that Ruby will be in Vienna in um, November in a fantastic workshop that Matthias is organizing on behalf of the SPE, which is all about digitalization. So check it out. We will leave the link here. And I'd like to say thank you to everybody for supporting. Um, this was a podcast or a video of the change workstream of DEETS, the digital energy technology section of the SPE. And my name is Patrick Patai. See you at Deeds. Thank you very much and bye-bye.